When was the fall of the Roman Empire? Was it in 410 when the Visigoths sacked Rome? Or 455 when the Vandals plundered Rome? Or was it in 476 when the last Western Roman Emperor was deposed? Whatever the answer, the people alive on the ground at the time certainly didn't wake up to a headline that said, Rome has fallen, commence medieval barbarianism. Only later did historians pinpoint certain dates. It's possible, therefore, that we're already past the date that would be considered the fall of the American Empire. Perhaps historians will look back and say that September 11th, 2001 marks the sacking of the American Empire. Not because the Twin Towers fell, but because that's the day that rule of law and due process came crashing down as well. History may shed more light on the silent coup that happened behind the scenes and transitioned the United States into a relative dictatorship. Yes, just like in Rome, the appearances carried on. The Senate still passed bills, and the courts still nominally gave fair trials. But the great erosion hit a turning point. From there on out, due process was not required to assassinate enemies of the U.S., to spy on potential terrorists, and even to confiscate property using civil asset forfeiture. Or perhaps the CIA already took over as dictators of the American empire back in 1963 with the assassination of the last truly elected U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Maybe the fall of the U.S. empire will be seen in terms of the destruction of the U.S. dollar, the 1913 creation of the Federal Reserve, the 1933 debasement of gold-backed currency, and the 1971 total removal of the gold standard from the U.S. dollar are all part of the slow downfall. These are the events which allowed the barbarians who invaded the U.S. government to loot the treasury, culminating in this, perhaps, final stage of vast money printing. It may be more obvious in hindsight that the U.S. government is currently only a shell, a vehicle that serves the barbarians to loot the corpse of a once great empire. Some people think that the American empire will simply be replaced by the next globally dominant superpower. And of course, there are some concerns that China is next in line to dominate the globe, as I discuss in another video on how China used COVID to play Western civilization. But more likely is the death of all nation states. As we transition out of the industrial age and into the age of information. I'm going to explain what I mean, but first a quick note. One short video will never do these concepts justice. So if you're interested in this subject, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way you'll receive a slow drip of content like this that will help you transition into this new age at this really exciting time to be alive. Back to the point. Let me explain why the industrial age was characterized by large nation states. See, the nation state is more than just a country or a government. Those have existed for thousands of years. The nation state aims to bind massive numbers of people in a territory together with myths of common cause, culture, and patriotism. This allows a single government to extract much more revenue and build much bigger armies. And this large-scale government rose with the industrial era because countries required large-scale armies to defend the industrial production in a given area. The scale provided by nation states allowed industry to invest and grow in areas that were relatively safe from the plunder and destruction by barbarians or rival countries. Since a factory can't so easily pick up and move, it needs a stable environment and protection in order to make the large capital investment worth the risk. Therefore, powerful nation states attracted more industry and thus became richer in the process. Less stable regions with smaller governments unable to protect their capital did not become as wealthy. But that situation is rapidly changing as wealth becomes less about material production and more based on information technology and human capital. These things are extremely mobile and not very susceptible to plunder. They therefore do not require the protection of massive nation states in order to justify the investments. And for this reason, we are witnessing in real time the fall of the nation state. But again, when you're so close to such a major global shift, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's happening. The end of the industrial age won't be obvious, and only in the future will historians look back and try to pinpoint a day or year that the world transitioned into the age of information. One great candidate for the fall of the nation state would be November 9th, 1989, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. This heralded the demise of the Soviet Union, a massive nation state which tried to bind citizens of various countries and cultures together under patriotism.
patriotism for the socialist cause. 1989 is also a great year to mark the end of the industrial era because it is the year that the World Wide Web was invented, marking the beginning of all the massive changes that would come to the world through the internet and mass communication. Also, 1989 was the year that I was born, so I like to think of myself as yet another herald for the glorious death of the nation state. We have been in the industrial era since the end of the feudal age. If we want to pick a nice clean date, we might pinpoint 1492 as the major shift, with Columbus's exploration being an early sign of nation states competing for industrial capital. As the Renaissance bloomed, the power of the Catholic Church faded, and a new myth was required to bind the people to their governments. The nation state replaced feudal chivalry with nationalist citizenship. Knights inspired by chivalry, loyal to their lords, were replaced by soldiers, inspired by patriotism, loyal to mother nation. But now those myths hold less power. People, companies, and capital are more mobile than ever. They frequently shop around for the best jurisdictions to live in, work in, and run a business. Smaller countries and city-states are actually better positioned than nation-states to take advantage of this. Without the need for massive government and military spending, they can offer government services as a product, based on the actual cost of providing that product. There are already a number of signs of the transition to government as a service provider, such as Caribbean nations selling citizenship through investment, Estonia selling e-citizenship, places like the country Georgia, Panama, Portugal, and so many others offering competitive tax rates to attract residents and business. Of course, it may seem like these small nations will be threatened by massive governments with huge armies that could take over, sort of like what's happened with China and Hong Kong. And this is still a threat. The dying nation state will not go out without a fight. They will fight to preserve their power in a changing world. They will exploit crises like pandemics and terrorism to make it seem like we still need the nation state. But these efforts will inevitably fail because the nation state can no longer grow rich through conquest and plunder. It's easy to move vast wealth when it's all in information technology and the human mind, capable of working from anywhere in the world, connected via the internet. The need for large governments and armies to protect the capital is fading because the ability of large governments and armies to take the capital is fading. And competition among a hopefully growing number of countries will make it so that governments cannot charge you above a market rate for their services. No more paying 50% of your income for some basic subpar services. The price will be based on product, with plenty of jurisdictions offering a la carte government services. New models of governments will mean government is no longer characterized by involuntary monopolization on land and force. Instead, we will see free private cities where you sign a contract with the government, virtual governments, which behave similar to insurance companies, distributed governments, which do not require their citizens to all be located in the same geographic area, and so much more innovation in how societies will be governed. That said, plenty of people will be left behind by these new great forms of government, because they'll simply refuse to believe that Rome has collapsed. Shells of nation states will remain, offering the worst conditions for the price. But even these may be forced to adapt if only to compete with these new, better, more efficient forms of government, or should I say governance. Unfortunately, this does not mean that we can simply ignore the dying nation states. They may be more dangerous than ever at this stage, implementing their own inquisitions to desperately route out anybody who dares criticize the nation state. This does pose a bit of a balancing act for the sovereign individual. We have to, at the same time, make sure that we don't become targets of the dying nation state's wrath, while making sure that its rules don't hold us back from participating in the dawn of a new age. There are still enough legal avenues to participate in the new era of humanity that we don't have to poke the nation state and risk our own lives and freedom. Pay as little taxes as possible. Relocate to the best jurisdiction you can find. Diversify so that you can safely weather the storm. We're living in extremely interesting times with the promise of an amount of individual freedom which has never before been available. Again, this is a huge subject, so definitely subscribe and hit that little bell notification so that you'll be notified every time I come out with a new piece of content. Also, join my email list in case YouTube decides to delete me in pursuit of keeping the dying nation state on life support. Also, you might consider reading the book, The Sovereign Individual, Mastering
during the transition to the information age, which most of this video is based on this book. It's really fascinating because one, it's about 20 years old and you can already see how some of the predictions have come true. And two, because it really goes deep in diving into the history of these changing eras and exactly what this transition is going to mean for an individual. So you might want to check that out. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm Joe Jarvis. Come back and see me again soon.